Um, thank you very much for your time this evening, sir. So this adjustment fund, as I understand it, has three elements to it. Walk us through what they are and what each of them will be doing. I think that thank you for having me and good evening to Africa, good evening to the world. I, I, I basically, uh, my understanding is that you have the general, uh, um, the general base, okay? I mean, you have what the, the uh, what we call the uh, adjustment facility, general adjustment facility base. Then you're going to have the credit facility. Then you're also going to have the uh, uh, the concessional uh, facility. And so basically you're looking at these three key elements. You have the general base. You also have the, uh, as I said, the concessional and then you also have the uh, credit base. These will form uh, what will go into the adjustment facility. And for the credit base or the credit facility, it will serve the interests of party states whose private sector and public sector might need this adjustment in terms of productive basis, in terms of export. Then you're looking at also the uh, the general base. As the general base, you're going to look at the support of this uh, facility for after policy. I mean, after after members and after members. But the the concessional one is to support the immediate short to medium term uh, party states who will lose a lot of revenue as a result of the tariff liberalization over a period of uh, say five years or ten years or just as trading started last year so so essentially is this is this fund going to be uh, does it have a sunset clause uh, or are there specific um, triggers written into it that say if these specific conditions of say trade or trade or revenue from trade tariffs are met we can shut this fund down as a matter of fact my understanding is that the after party states were divided into three economic zones or two major economic zones, least developed economies and developed economies. And so it was agreed in the agreement that the least developed economies will liberalize for a period of time. And during that time, we also have the group of six who are the least, the very least developed. In fact, they are very, very under 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 really under 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 uh developed and so for them it was agreed that they will be given two-year credit facility and mind you this facility is without interest there is it's interest free it rather attract the trade charges so there wasn't a, a specific condition as of now i'm sure that will be factored in but basically the group of six will receive this two years credit facility to support them over the period of two years while they put in a lot of productive uh, mechanism in place. And, what, for those and, and what, happens, the, what happens if they don't? Um, because we have seen instances in the, in the last 10, 20 years where countries say, we'd like to liberalize certain sectors of the economy, we'd like to make specific reforms, and then they don't do it. Now, if there's this sort of money on the table, what are the performance metrics for accessing that money. If you don't make those reforms, um, will, it, will a country essentially be barred from getting access to this adjustment fund? We are yet to uh, see the details unraveling. However, because the sources of these res of these uh, adjustment facility is going to be among, come from the members themselves. The first one, I mean, the, it's going to come from among the party states. And then also uh, a bit will come from grants. And so if party states are contributing towards this adjustment facility as we move on, then it's imperative that every mechanism will laid in place for them to repay. And I think that uh, contingency measures will also be put in place to ensure that there wouldn't be any form of default. Right. Um, with respect to countries that have rigid capital controls or those that are struggling with um, multiple exchange rates, um, Nigeria, Zimbabwe do come to mind. How exactly will this 
facility work? Because in that sort of environment, there's a lot of room for, for arbitrage, at least by some of the parties that might be receiving this money. The good news is that that um, unforeseen or that, for, uh, uh, that uh, inevitable is being remedied at this time by the Pan-African Payment Settlement System. And the good news is that this Pan-African Payment and Settlement System is being run by the Afriasian Bank themselves. And what the, the payment system seeks to do is also to really, uh, really sort out these uh, rigid capital uh, controls. That is key because if you look at the whole uh, idea or the whole settlement system, you have the uh, the settlement in terms of uh, agreeable uh, exchange, foreign exchange or an exchange rate, which among the central banks at an agreeable settlement. And so that will solve that aspect of what we are all uh, foreseeing. Another good thing is that with the uh, coming of the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System, transfers, all forms of transfers, remits, not only with the party states, but with private and public sector, will be exchanged within the local currencies of party members. And that makes it more easily done. And so there wouldn't be difficult at the uh, electronic clearing houses among the central banks. Right. Well, an African payment system is the panacea at this time. Oh, all right. It, it's a fascinating conversation. I wish we had more time for it. Uh, Louis Full, Group Executive Director of the CFD Policy Network Group from Accra in Ghana. Thank you very much for your time.